Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, you know, it's a privilege to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, my wife and I haven't uh, worshipped in this church very often. Uh, we were here last week, and then I think it's been it was a, at least a couple of years uh, before that when we were here. But I always remember coming here because it's such a warm, friendly church. You're such a warm, warm congregation. Praise the Lord for that. So um, this morning, um, the message is uh, entitled "Embracing God's Goodness." But let me start by asking you a question. How many of you guys believe that God is good? And you say God is good all the time? All the time? That's amen. Praise the Lord. That's right. God is looking out for us uh, all the time. He's not like us, right? He doesn't, uh, he doesn't take naps. He doesn't sleep or slumber. He doesn't get bored, right? He doesn't, uh, doesn't decide that, uh, you know, it's just, he's just too busy. He has something else to do. And, you know, when I think about God looking out for us all the time, uh, I'm reminded of a, of a story. Um, uh, it's about a mother whose uh, kindergarten age son uh, wanted to uh, walk to school alone. And his name was Timmy. And, and, uh, and, and mom wanted to give Timmy a, an a opportunity to feel independent. Uh, but at the same time, she wanted to know that he was safe. And so she had this idea of how to handle it. Um, she would ask this neighbor friend of hers if she would follow Timmy to school in the mornings, staying at a, at a distance so he wouldn't probably uh, figure out that she was there. And the neighbor said, yeah, that, that was great. She's happy to do that because it turns out her, she and her toddler are up at that time anyway. It would be a good way for them to get out and get some exercise. And so she agreed. And so the next school day, the uh, neighbor and her uh, little girl set out falling behind Timmy. And Timmy was walking to school with another little neighbor girl who he knew. We'll call her Susie. And uh, so this continued for the whole week. And as the two kids walked, they chatted and they kicked stones and twigs. But Susie noticed that this same lady had been following her for the whole week. And finally, she couldn't take it anymore. And she asked Timmy, she said, do you know that lady? And Timmy says, uh, yeah, sure, I know who she is. That's my mom's friend, Shirley. That's Shirley Goodnest. And that's her daughter, Marcy. So why is she following us, Susie asks. She says, well, Timmy says, you know, every night my mom makes me read this text from the Bible called the 23rd Psalm because she worries about me and stuff. And it says that Shirley Goodness and Marcy will follow me all the days of my life. So I guess we better get used to it. You know, Timmy might have been a little bit confused about the text, but he was right that God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Amen? Amen. But this morning, I want you to know that God doesn't just want us to get used to it. In fact, God wants us to turn around and embrace that goodness. He wants us to grab a hold of it. And he wants us to hold on to it with all the strength that we have. And you know, as Christians, we, we often associate goodness, God's goodness, with his salvation that he freely offers us. Amen? Has any of you ever been asked the question, um, are you saved? And, uh, you know, you don't have to give me an answer to this, but think about how you respond to that question. You know, the good news this morning is that if you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, and if you've committed to follow him, then you can say with confidence right here, right now, this morning, I have been saved. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 tells us that by grace we have been saved. Amen? So there it is. We have been saved. That's a past tense. And the Bible even tells us what we've been saved from, right? Romans chapter 6, verses 23. And by the way, in the interest of time and, and, and getting you to potluck at a reasonable time, uh, I'm going to put all my texts on the screen, and I'm going to go a little bit fast. So, you know, if you want to write them down or follow along in your Bible um, later, um, you know, that, that'll be easier than you trying to keep up with, with the pace of this. So Romans chapter 6, 23 tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. And so we, there we, we learn what we've been saved from. We have been saved from sin's penalty, which is what? Death. Death. That's right. That's right. 
And that's God's goodness at work, right? That's part of his good news. But the good news is also that God wants to do more than save us from the penalty of sin. You see, God is so good that he also wants to save us from the effects of sin right here on this earth. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who, of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, I want you to notice that being saved, right? Those of you who can think back a little bit to your, maybe your high school English grammar will recognize there the present progressive tense or the present continuous tense. And this is the tense that we use in English when something, we want to refer to something that is going on right now and is going to keep going on for some period of time, right? So God is in the process of saving us. Amen? Amen. And then one day, when everyone has had a chance to make a decision from God, the Bible tells us that God will save us from the very presence of sin itself. Amen? Amen? That's what we call glorification, when God makes all things new, and we get to go to live with him. And I really love this text. It's one of my favorites. Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 to 5, tells us that this event is in the future. Let's read it. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are what? Are true and faithful. So brothers and sisters, there's your answer. There's your answer to that question, are you saved? I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved right now, right here on this earth, from the very effects of sin. And I will be saved from the presence of sin when God restores the earth. Can you say amen? amen? And you know, we could probably stop there right now and just go to potluck, right? Because that is the essence of the gospel, amen? amen. That is God's goodness in a nutshell. But this morning, I want to take a little bit closer look at the process of being saved. I want to look at how God's goodness actually changes us right here on this earth before Jesus comes. What kind of people do we become? How do people around us experience the goodness of God through us? But before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Father, we, we pray that you would speak to me and through me and that you'd open our hearts, Lord, so that we can be impacted by the words that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I think of God and his goodness, I can't help but think about this text. It's the first text that comes to mind for me, right? Uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, and you all know it well. But before this, 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 this verse, the, God is pleading with the nation of Israel. And he's saying, look, I, I'm not satisfied with all these burnt offerings and the calves and the rivers of oil. That's not goodness. That's not goodness. And then through the prophet Micah, God says, uh, prophet Micah says, he, speaking of God, has shown you. Oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so there, the prophet sums up God's idea of goodness. And he says it's justice, mercy, and humility. And he says that's what God wants from me. But, but is, it, is, it, is it that easy? I mean, when we, you, this seems like a simple text, but then when I, when I step back for a minute and I th try to think about it a little bit more, sometimes I realize it can seem a little confusing because think about this for a second. If I am to be just, doesn't that mean giving people the treatment they deserve? Yeah. Treating them fairly, right? Yeah. Okay. But if I'm to be merciful, doesn't that mean not giving people what they deserve? How can I embrace both of these ideas at the same time? 
without them being contradictory. Doesn't mercy require some element of forgiveness for me to give a, a, a lesser or maybe no punishment, right? I have to be able to forgive. You know, I'm struck by the fact that as human beings, we all want justice for the bad guy, the person that did us wrong, right? And we all want mercy and forgiveness for who? For ourselves, right? <laughs> so let's look at these two concepts, because if God wants us to embrace them, then it's important for us to ask, what does the Bible really say about them, right? And what happens when we embrace a false view of these concepts? Let me start by telling you a true story. The names are changed here, but um, Maria uh, attended church regularly. In fact, she attended the same church uh, where a Christian psychiatrist uh, attended, and she were, they were you know, acquaintances. And one day after church, the psychiatrist could see that Maria was very, very troubled. And he asked her what was wrong, and, and, and after some hesitation, uh, she told him that her 25-year-old daughter, who we'll call Sylvia, had married, recently married a man named Hector. Um, and Maria had had some serious concerns about Hector, but she had kept her mouth shut. She wanted to be supportive. And the wedding was now eight months ago. But only two weeks after the honeymoon, Maria started noticing mysterious bruises on Sylvia's body. And now her daughter was evasive. And, and, and when, when Maria would ask about it, she'd make up all kinds of excuses. But the bruises continued until Sylvia could no longer maintain the fiction and admitted that Hector was beating her up regularly. And Maria was enraged, and she confronted Hector. But, but Hector re responded with, with amused indifference. In fact, in fact, the more it bothered Maria, the more Hector seemed to sadistically enjoy it. And Maria, eventually, over time, she lost her peace. She couldn't stop thinking about her daughter. Of course, she counseled her to leave, but Sylvia insisted that God wanted her to honor the sanctity of the marriage vow. And so Maria's anger built. Her dreams became haunted by, by, by images of the abuse that her daughter was experiencing. Not only that, her dreams were haunted by images of the abuse that she wanted to inflict on Hector in revenge. You see, brothers and sisters, sin is insidious. We barely notice it at first when it takes root, and it grows slowly until one day it has thoroughly corrupted our minds. And for Maria, church was no longer a place of peace. Sure, she, she came and she heard the stories of Jesus' love and sacrifice, and she sang the songs, but they had no meaning for her. In fact, she wanted the God of the Old Testament. She wanted a God who would rain fire and brimstone down on Hector's head. She wanted a God who would make him pay. And if you spoke to Maria about forgiveness, she didn't want to hear about it, right? She just wanted vengeance. And, and, and what she didn't realize for a while is that that desire had changed her from a loving person into a bitter, hateful person. But when she finally acknowledged, was able to understand what had happened to her, all that anger and all that bitterness and all that hatred in her heart, she was willing to embrace those emotions because she felt that's what God wanted for her. She said God wanted her to have this thing called justice. Not forgiveness, justice. And Maria decided that she wanted a God who would condone her desire for revenge and retribution in the name of justice. And when after several conversations, a psychiatrist pointed out how Hector's sin was destroying her, Maria became angry and she walked away. But, but you know, it, it's easy to maybe condemn Maria here, but how would you feel in that situation? You know, think about it. How do you feel if it's your child being abused? Wouldn't you want to make that person pay? Wouldn't that be justice? You know, that kind of justice feels natural to us as human beings, right? That's why we believe God would want to dish out the same kind of justice. But if human desire for justice is so good, then why does it result in so many negative emotions, right? If it's so right for us, why does it seem to hurt us and not heal us? 
So is it possible that we have justice all wrong? Is it possible that we have misunderstood biblical justice? You know, there's an old uh, pastor uh, friend of, of mine, my family, um, some of the old evangelists, some of you might remember him, uh, Pastor Byron Spears. And uh, Pastor Spears used to say, whatever God has the, uh, tr- whatever, he used to say, whatever God has the true of, Satan has the counterfeit, Right? You see, sin rarely steps up and presents itself as a destructive agent, right? It presents itself as something that makes sense and looks good and feels good, right? Whatever God has the true of, Satan has the counterfeit. So here's a question. Is it possible that what we think of as justice today is Satan's counterfeit? And where does forgiveness come into play? So brothers and sisters, this morning I want you to know, first of all, that justice and mercy are inextricably linked. They go together. And they are both two sides of the same cure, God's antidote for healing our sin-sick hearts. Okay? Both of them are necessary. But before we understand forgiveness, let's look at justice. Because if we don't get a correct understanding of justice, then we never really want to embrace mercy. So let's go back to Micah 6.8 for a minute. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And you know, I often used to think of this verse as basically saying, look, you need to balance your justice with your mercy, right? A little justice here, a little mercy there, you know? The scales kind of balance out. We need to temper our desire for revenge with mercy and forgiveness. But I've come to realize that this is not what this text means at all. If we go back and we look at the original language uh, that this text was, was created in, you will find that this word translated here justly can simply be translated as right. Okay? So if we look at this text and we think about it slightly differently, we can read it as saying, act right or do right, love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Another way of saying it is, this is God is saying, this is what I want from you. Always do the right thing to others. Then then love to forgive others when they do the wrong thing to you. And then finally, when you're starting to think, hey, this is so unfair, just remember that my ways are not your ways. Right? Have humility when you think about who I am and why I know this is good for you. Right? Do you see that? Okay has nothing to do with fair punishment for crime or for sin. But, but it's, it, it is important for us for a minute to go back and think about this word justice and what it means today to us. So, you know, would you agree that today our concept of justice, or even back in the Bible days, justice implies the existence of law? Can, can, we, can we agree? In fact... Uh, The Webster's Dictionary describes justice this way. It says it's the process or result of using laws to fairly judge and punish crimes and criminals. So what justice means in a particular situation is defined by the laws that govern that situation. Does that make sense? Let, Let me give you an example. If we're playing baseball, and let's say I'm the pitcher and I decide to run over and slug another player on the other team in the face... Uh, and the umpire does, uh, lets me get away with it. Is that okay? No. Is that just? No. Okay, of course not, right? That, 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 wh- why not? Why isn't it just? Well, because the rules of baseball don't allow me to do that, right? Okay? Now, if I was playing another sport... And uh, the same, the same thing happens. The bell rings, and I walk over and I punch my opponent in the face, and the um, umpire does nothing. Would that be just? Yeah. Yes, of course it was, because the rules of this sport allow it, right? That, that's right. Box. The rules of baseball and boxing are very different. One prohibits punching in, anybody in the face, and the other one allows it, right? Do you get my point? All right. 
After the 9-11 tragedy, President George W. Bush very famously spoke to a joint session of Congress, and he said these words. He said, whether we bring our enemies to justice or justice to our enemies, justice will be done. And his point was clear. We all understood it. He, he, his point was that the United States would hunt down the perpetrators and they would exact, we would ex exact revenge upon those responsible for that horrific crime. But is the justice of a vengeful nation the same as God's justice? When in John chapter 18, verse 36, uh, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Do you think he was trying to tell us something? Right? When the Bible represents kingdoms of this world as ferocious beasts, but uses a lamb to represent Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, could the Bible be trying to suggest that somehow these systems of government are fundamentally different? We sometimes refer to God's law, the law that governs his, that, 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 that governs his, his, his kingdom, as the law of what? The law of love. The law of love, right? And that's because that's exactly how Jesus described it. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. The scribe asks Jesus, which is the most com com uh, important commandment? And Jesus replies with love. He says, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, all the laws given through uh, the, the, the prophets through the ages are all based on this principle. So this is the law that governs God's kingdom. So now let's look at some texts and let's see if we can get an idea of how this thing called justice works under this law of love. Let's start with Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 through 9. God is speaking here about how his kingdom operates. And he says, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon then, as if to acknowledge how little sense this is going to make to us as human beings, he adds, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And it sounds very much like that Mike part, last part of Micah 6, 8, doesn't it? Right? Walk humbly with our God. But I want you to notice here how God wants to deal with the wicked man who turns to him. Did you notice that? What does God want to do to him? He wants to have mercy on him. He wants to freely pardon him. This is our first clue that there's something very different about God's justice. All right? Let's take a look at another text. Uh, Psalm chapter 82, verses 1 through 4, it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And now, speaking to the children of Israel, he says, how long will you judge unjustly? And show partiality to the wicked, Salah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. Now, I want you to notice here, when God judges, what is he focused on? He's focused on deliverance of the oppressed. Do you see that? He is not, in this text, justice is not something that is done to the evildoer. Justice is something that God is doing for the oppressed. Right? That's why it's for the afflicted and the needy. Let's look at another text. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. God is admonishing here the rebellious kingdom of Judah. And he says, wash yourselves clean, make yourself clean, put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice. And then he tells them what seeking justice is about. He says, read this with me, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. And there you see it again, God says, do justice, help the people that need help, right? Let's look at another text. I really want you to get this. Jeremiah chapter 21, verses, uh, verse 12. And I like how the New Living Translation renders this. It says, this is what the Lord says to the dynasty of David. Give justice each morning to the people you judge. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from the oppressors. You see, brothers and sisters, are you getting the theme here? 
Here's the amazing truth about biblical justice is biblical justice is about delivering the oppressed, not about punishing the oppressor. And I want you to know this morning that justice as a form of re human revenge, revenge is a human concept. It's not a biblical one. Now, I do want you to understand what I'm saying. Revenge and discipline are two different things, okay? They're two entirely different concepts. So discipline that is designed to teach, to heal, to restore, to protect, is consistent with God's laws. Amen? So when a society places a criminal in jail or exacts a fine to teach them and others that certain behavior is unacceptable, that is consistent with God's laws. When society locks up a violent sociopath to protect the communities from that person, that is consistent with God's laws. But along with our motivation to teach and protect, God wants us to be motivated to heal and restore. Can you say amen? amen? That's what ministering to those in prison is all about, right? That's why in Matthew chapter 5, verse 36, Jesus commends his followers, not just for feeding the hungry, but for visiting those in prison, right? It's about redemption. And as Christians, God never wants us, our actions to be motivated by revenge. Why? Because that's not who he is, right? That's not who he is. And if we're to represent him, then we have to be willing to be like him. Amen? Amen. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, someone in the back of their mind is probably thinking, well, what about that whole Old Testament thing about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and all of that, right? You can find that concept. As a matter of fact, let's find it. Legit Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 through 20. Let's read what God told them. Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must be, make restitution life for life. Anyone who injures the neighbor is to be injured in the same manner, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Hmm. But you know, even uh, non-Christians non <coughs> uh, can see the danger in this. You know, it was Gandhi who famously said, uh, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind, right? So how can we understand what was going on at the time this was written? And I, and I, I really started to understand this after I read uh, this, this, this little quote I'm going to show you here um, from the author of a book named The God-Shaped -shaped Brain. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, he said, It was only when I looked through the eyes of Jesus, speaking about this text, that I saw something different. I wondered, what if God gave these instructions to a group of people who killed an offender for any misdeed, imparting death for the most insignificant misdemeanor? What if he gave these instructions to a group of people who would eventually kill their king, who was blameless? In this situation, in that situation, would God be severe or would he be graciously taking a brutish people and moving them towards mercy? towards grace, and towards forgiveness. And it reminded me of a story. In August 2007, an NPR journalist reporting from the war in Iraq described a tragedy involving a young shepherd, Iraqi shepherd boy less than 12 years old. Um, the boy was playing throwing stones, and one of his stones accidentally hit a farmer's cow in the eye and blinded him. The farmer went home, got his gun, came back, and shot the boy dead. Brothers and sisters, I believe that God's instruction in Leviticus was for a people who were just like that farmer. A people with hearts so hard, it was impossible for them to even conceive of outright forgiveness. A people so selfish and so self-centered, it was impossible for them to love the way God loves us. A people so prone to senseless and disproportionate violence, that they would think nothing of killing a child who accidentally hurt a cow. God's instruction was meant to arrest that senseless violence, so that 1,500 years later, when Jesus arrived on the scene, they would be ready to see and hear what God is really like. They would be ready to learn that only forgiveness can really vanquish evil from our hearts.
And, and then Jesus could take those laws that were designed to keep them from self-destructing as a people and tell them what the kingdom of God was really like. In fact, he did exactly that, right? Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 45. Jesus said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, do what? Turn the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles with them. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it said that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of who? Of your father in heaven, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Look, Jesus was saying, I know you learned all these things. But that was at a time when you were too stiff-necked to ever understand who I really am. To ever understand what my justice is like. That was at a time when I was just trying to keep you from self-destructing by senselessly killing each other. But now I'm here, you can see me in the flesh. Now you can see this is the way my kingdom works. This is who you will need to become if you need to be children of the Heavenly Father. So brothers and sisters, my, first, my point here is just simply this. God's justice is about doing right, helping others in need. Okay, And once we let go of this idea that justice is about focusing on retribution, on revenge, on punishing, then we're ready to embrace the biblical concept of mercy. And forgiveness. Now remember, I said, whatever God has the true of, Satan has the what? The counterfeit, right? Satan has the counterfeit. So would it surprise you that Satan has promoted counterfeit ideas of mercy? Yeah. Right? In fact, uh, he's created a whole series of myths around mercy, and I'm going to very, very quickly go through just a few of those myths. So bear with me here this morning. Myth number one. Forgiveness comes after the offending individual says they are sorry. How many of you have ever felt that way? You know, I'll forgive him or her when they come to me and they beg for forgiveness and they admit they were wrong. Right? This myth exists because we don't really understand what forgiveness is or why we need it. Let me explain it to you. Forgiveness, brothers and sisters, is the antidote for the hardness that sin causes in our hearts. Okay, let me say that again. Forgiveness is the antidote for the hardness that the sin causes in our hearts. Now, let me, let me illustrate it this way. Imagine you are, have been bitten by a poisonous snake. And the venom starts to slowly work its way through your body. Now, unless someone comes along soon and gives you an antidote, you will die. Even though you don't feel sick right now. Okay, you feel perfectly fine right now. Because that's how sin is. All right? Especially when we feel we've been wronged. It's working slowly, insidiously, hardening our hearts. Now imagine for a moment that the, the, the entity we had to depend on to give us the antidote is the snake himself. Okay? That's who we need to depend on to get the antidote, the person who caused the harm. How good are our chances of survival? Uh, not very good at all, right? The snake will just bite us again, right? But brothers and sisters, God has arranged things so that we have the power to summon the antidote ourselves. It's called forgiveness. Our ability to forgive is the antidote. Now, imagine that I have the antidote, but I choose not to use it. Why? Because I'm mad at the snake. Does that make any sense? No, my forgiveness is not for the snake. The antidote is for me, not the snake, right? And by the way, I, brothers and sisters, that's how God remains who he is. God remains who he is by forgiving immediately, by never holding anything against us. That's why his heart never hardens, right? That's why we don't have to torment ourselves over whether, whether we have, we've asked forgiveness for every sin. You know, did, did, I, did I remember to ask forgiveness for that? That time I stole $10 from my dad's wallet so I could buy comic books when I was seven years old. You know, do I need to worry about that? No. 
Okay? Because God has already forgiven us. Amen? Let me just, uh, oops, lost my way here. Myth number two. Forgiveness equals salvation. Do you believe that? Okay, how many people believe that? How many people don't believe that? Show of hands. All right, let's look at this one. Because God has forgiven you immediately, does that mean you're saved? Right? Let's look at Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to 44. Um, it says, when they, when, they, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Now, who are the they in this text? The, and the, the Roman soldiers, right? Right? Okay. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, and they divided his clothes by casting lots. Now, did the soldiers ask for forgiveness before this? No, Jesus immediately forgave them without any need to ask. Does that mean these soldiers were saved? No. no. Did the act of forgiveness, of Jesus' act of forgiveness, change their hearts? Were they now friends of God? No, because we saw right after his forgiveness, they spent their time dividing up his clothes and casting lots. Right? Brothers and sisters, God's forgiveness does nothing to change the state of my salvation. You see, reconciliation requires more than forgiveness. It requires a change in my heart, and it requires a turning away from wrong. We call that repentance. Amen? Imagine that I'm mad at you about something. So the next time I see you, I punch you in the face and walk away. And while you're standing there with your bloody nose, the Holy Spirit impresses you to forgive me. You feel... Something must be terribly wrong with my life for me to act so violently. You recognize I'm not myself. So you forgive me. You forgive me. And you want to help me. And so you, you, you want to find out what's going on. And so you follow me. And, and, and you catch up to me. And just as you're about to tell me you forgive me, I punch you in the nose again. Have we accomplished reconciliation? No. Does that mean your forgiveness was not real? No, your forgiveness was real, but until I decide to turn away from my anger and stop punching you in the nose, we're probably not going to be friends, right? We're probably not going to be reconciled. And brothers and sisters, that's how it is with God. He forgives immediately, and he keeps coming after us to help us, but as long as we hold evil in our hearts, as long as we keep hurting him, he won't be able to connect with us and then we won't be able to accept the salvation that he freely offers us. Does this make sense to you? Myth number three. Forgiveness means that you're saying what the person did was okay. Brothers and sisters, this myth is a critical part of Satan's strategy to harden our hearts. You see, we're afraid that if there are no consequences for evil actions, the person will just keep repeating those actions. Okay? Question, when God forgives us, does this mean he's okay with our sin? No. God forgives us not because he condones sin. He forgives us so that he can communicate with us, so he doesn't end up cutting himself off from us, so that he can let us know that what we did is not okay and that he wants to heal us. When I forgive somebody that does me wrong, I don't have to say it's okay, I forgive you. All right? The message, in, that's not the message in forgiveness. The message is I am not going to give up on you. I still hope for a relationship. I, 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 but to make that relationship work, you have to stop doing wrong. Because what you did is not okay. My forgiveness doesn't make it okay. Myth number four. Forgiveness leads to greater vulnerability. If I forgive... I'm less likely to take steps to protect myself. Now, think about this one. Does this have to be true? Does it have to be true? No, right? Just because I forgive you doesn't mean I don't take steps to protect myself. In fact, statistically speaking, forgiving people are no less likely to be victimized than the unforgiving. 
right? Imagine you used to come over to my house, and you noticed that I had this habit of leaving lots of, of, of loose cash lying around in various places, and I also would go out and never lock my doors. And so one day when I was out, you broke into my house, and you stole a bunch of money, and some valuables too, and fortunately for me, my security cameras were on, caught you committing a crime, the police quickly arrested you and re recovered my stuff. Now let's say that I've chosen to forgive you. I don't want to hold hurt and hatred in my heart. I want an opportunity for reconciliation. I want there to be an opportunity to restore trust with you. Does that mean I should continue to leave my doors unlocked? No. no. Taking prudent steps to protect myself has nothing to do with forgiveness. I'm just as likely to start locking my doors and putting my valuables away as the person who didn't forgive. Right? And I understand that my forgiveness alone doesn't make you trustworthy. I understand that even after you repent, even after reconciliation has begun, it's going to take time and effort on your part and on mine to restore the trust that was lost. Right? I don't have to withhold my forgiveness to be safe. So I just want to be really, really clear about this point, brothers and sisters. There are times when we need to take steps to protect ourselves and or the people that we love from further harm. So the abused spouse does not have to stay in a position where the abuse can continue. Amen? The businessman does not have to keep the thief employed in a position of trust. Right? That's not what forgiveness demands. That's not what forgiveness is about. But even for the most grievous sin, forgiveness says, I won't harden my heart against you. I will still hope and pray for you. I will still look forward to a day when God's saving grace transforms you into the person he created you to be. Just like God's grace has to transform me. And I'll rejoice with you and celebrate the miracle of God's saving power. Right? Because God has forgiven you and he's forgiven me too. Amen? Does that make sense? But what happens if I withhold my forgiveness? Well, not only does it harden my heart and keep the Holy Spirit from healing me, but it turns out it hurts the relationships with people who have done me no harm. Okay? You see, think about it this way. Think about it this way. Think about, think about the injury being like a severe sunburn. What happens when someone doesn't realize your back is badly sunburned and comes up to you and gives you a great big hug? It hurts, right? You push everyone or you push people away, right? That person didn't cause your sunburn, but they feel some of the consequences of it, right? Their perfectly normal, kind actions causes a negative reaction from you and causes you to push the person away. But if the sunburn is healed, then that same action, that big hug, feels good, right? Well, that's how it is when you don't forgive others. All of your other relationships suffer. Your spouse your children, your family, your friends, people who mean you well, get pushed away. Are you following me? You build a protective wall around yourself, and brothers and sisters, that wall doesn't make you less vulnerable. It simply makes you less connected, less supported, and ultimately less happy. Which brings us to forgiveness myth number five. Forgiveness means restored trust. We've already hinted at this one. We won't spend much time on it. Trust is earned. It takes time to restore. Forgiveness is a choice we make to open the door to try to restore trust. Right? But forgiveness itself does not make that restoration happen. I'm not going to ask the person who stole from the company to take the cash to the bank every week. Right? I'm not going to ask the person who has abused children to run the daycare center. Right? But forgiveness means that I will see that person as capable of redemption and restoration. Right? And I will do everything I can in my power to allow God to work towards the rehabilitation of that person. Forgiveness myth number six. Forgiveness means forgetting. This one is tricky. Because brothers and sisters, in a sense, forgiveness does mean forgetting. But it's not forgetting the way we think of it. Forgiveness does not mean memory erasure. OK? Let me give you an example. Let's imagine it's your young child who's been stealing from you, taking money out of your purse. 
you catch that child in the act, and you punish that child in an age-appropriate manner, in a redemptive manner, do you forgive your child? Of course you do, right? You don't hold that stealing against them, right? Now, your child has grown up to be a responsible, mature, trustworthy adult person. When your child comes over to your home for a visit, do you always think before he comes, oh, the little thief is coming over. I better lock everything up. Does that go through your mind? No, right? You probably don't even remember the childhood incident, not because it's been erased from your memory, but because, because you, forgiving meant that you chose not to hold that act against your child, right? And over the course of time, it became of so little importance that it never comes up. It is forgotten as far as it relates to your relationship. Does that make sense? And this misconception is a result that of, of, of a misunderstanding we have from, you know, when in the book of Hebrews, God, you know, it, it, it's written, you know, God will remember our sins no more. And people mean, take that to mean that when we go to heaven, we'll have no memory of sin, no memory of the mistakes of the righteous. But let's think about that for a moment and see if that makes sense. Let's think about it for a moment. Think about David's sin with Bathsheba. The Bible tells us that God forgave David for that sin, that David repented turned away from the sin. But the Bible still contains a record of David's sin, does it not? Do you think that God and the angels have to close their eyes and shut their ears every time we read that story in the Bible? No, right? But I, you know, I, I, I know why it's easier for all of us sometimes to think memory erasure would be a better thing, right? Imagine, if you will, David and Bathsheba and Solomon, their son, and Uriah, the husband David, murdered all meeting in heaven. It seems like it would be a very difficult meeting, right? <laughs> Especially if everyone remembered what happened, right? But brothers and sisters, in heaven, our hearts will be healed. Can you say amen? amen? We won't use our memory to do harm, but to glorify God. Which brings us to our final forgiveness myth. Forgiveness means the guilty person gets away with it. And this is perhaps the most difficult misconception and this misconception only exists because we're used to thinking about sin the wrong way. We're used to thinking about sin like what, like, like the consequence uh, of what we, how it happens when we do when we speed, right? We're used to thinking of you know it being a violation of a set of externally imposed rules, so that then there has to be some externally imposed punishment. But when we realize that sin is simply not living in consequence with the design principles of the universe that God created us for, when we realize that this is what God's laws really are, they are design principles, then we realize that no one ever truly escapes the consequences of sin. Okay? Sin always extracts a price. When King David sinned by sleeping with another man's wife and then having that man killed to cover it up, the Bible tells us God forgave him of that horrible crime. The Bible tells us that David sincerely repented and he turned away from that evil. But did, God, did David get off scot-free? No. The consequences of David's sin were very real. Uriah was still very dead. David's sin led to a rebellion in the kingdom. Right? His son Absalom uh, uh, attempted to depose him as ruler. It left a scar on David's psyche that would never completely heal, at least not here on this earth. And brothers and sisters, no one gets away with sin. And the punishment for sin is not God's doing and doesn't affect his forgiveness. Imagine you tell your child every night to go upstairs and brush his or her teeth. And, 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 and you find out that your child has been putting... It's going to the bathroom, closing the door, putting some water on the toothbrush, and then putting it away and going to bed. Right? Would you take steps to correct that situation? Of course you would, right? You would do so as a protective and redemptive measure to save your child from future pain. But would you forgive your child? Of course you would, right? Would your forgiveness mean that your child has escaped all consequences? No, your child's teeth and gum health will be negatively affected regardless of what you do. The punishment was built into the violation. Okay? Neither you nor God had to impose that punishment. Brothers and sisters, forgiveness 
is not about letting the guilty individual get away with it. Forgiveness is the way we invite God into our hearts so that he can heal us and then use us to heal others. Amen? So this morning we've looked at two linked concepts, justice and mercy, forgiveness, grace and forgiveness. And we've learned these concepts don't work against each other. They work with each other to connect us to God. We've learned that biblical justice is not about taking revenge on the oppressor. It's helping, about helping the oppressed. And we've learned that biblical mercy is, is, not, is, is, is not about being okay with wrongdoing. It's about not hardening our heart, right? About being willing to forgive and redeem our relationships so that God can work through us with others. And so as we close, as the music starts playing just softly in the background, I want to leave you with one final story. Because it's easy to, to talk about all of this, um, you know, in theory. But what does embracing this type of goodness, God's goodness, look like in real practical terms? What does it look like in a modern day 21st century Christian? Because, you know, concepts are all okay, but it makes a difference when we see these concepts played out in someone's life. On December 25th, 2013, Ronnie Smith was shot and killed in Benghazi, Libya. And uh, Ronnie was uh, going for a morning jog. And in response, his wife, Anita, wrote this letter. And I'm going to read you this letter verbatim. It is a letter entitled, An Open Letter from the Widow of Ronnie Smith to the Libyan People. And Anita Smith wrote this. She said, My husband and best friend, Ronnie Smith, loved the Libyan people. For more than a year, Ronnie served as a chemistry teacher in a school in Benghazi. And he would gladly have given more years to Libya if unknown gunmen had not cut his life short on December 5th, 2013. Ronnie and I came to Libya because we saw the suffering of the Libyan people, but we also saw your hope, and we wanted to partner with you to build a better future. Libya was very different from what we had experienced before, but we were excited to learn about Libyan culture. Ronnie grew to love you and your way of life as I did. Ronnie really was Libya's best friend. Friends and family from home were concerned about our safety, as, as were some of you. And we talked about this more times than I can count. But because we believed the Libyan people were worth the risk, that's why we stayed. Even knowing what I know right now, I have no doubt we would both make the same decision it all over again. Ronnie loved you all so much, especially his students. He loved to joke with you, tell stories about you, help you with your lives, and challenge you to be all you could be. He did his best to live out his faith humbly and respectfully within a community of people with a different faith. To his attackers, I love you and forgive you. How could I not? For Jesus taught us to love our enemies, not to kill them or seek revenge. Jesus sacrificed his life out of love for the very people who killed him, as well as for us today. His death and resurrection opened the door for us to walk on a straight path to God in peace and forgiveness. Ronnie loved you because God loves you. Ronnie loved you because God loved him, not because Ronnie was so great, but because God is so great. To the Libyan people, I always expected that God would give us a heart to love you, but I never expected you to love us so much. We came to bless you, but you have blessed us much more. Thank you. Thank you for your support and love for Ronnie and our son, Hosea, and me. Since Ronnie's death, my love for you has increased in ways I never imagined. I feel closer to you now than ever before. I hear people speaking with hate and anger and blame over Ronnie's death, but that's not what Ronnie would want. Ronnie would want his death to be an opportunity for us to show one another love and forgiveness 
Because that's what God has shown us. I want all of you, all of the people of Libya to know that I'm praying for the peace and prosperity of Libya. May Ronnie's blood shed on Libyan soil encourage peace and reconciliation between the Libyan people and God. Signed, Anita Smith. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to embrace God's goodness. It means embracing godly justice. Just as Ronnie and Anita Smith were doing, they were helping the oppressed. In other words, they were being just like him. Amen? And it means embracing godly forgiveness, just as Anita Smith has done. Embracing forgiveness of those who have hurt us in ways that, that, that are unimaginable. This is God's goodness at work. And this goodness doesn't come naturally. It isn't easy. It doesn't make sense to us. And that's why God asks us in Micah 6, 8 to walk humbly with him. Because his thoughts and his ways are beyond our understanding. God f alone fully understands how best to cure us of sin. And he has to heal our damaged hearts and our minds to make this kind of justice and forgiveness even person possible. But the very medicine he uses for that, the very medicine that he uses for true healing is biblical justice, helping the oppressed like Ronnie did, and biblical forgiveness, the kind he places placed in Anita's heart. And when we act in ways that are just and forgiving and redemptive, God heals our heart. And guess what happens? More justice and mercy flows out until one day, before we know it, like Anita Smith, we fully reflect who Jesus really is. Brothers and sisters, this morning, Jesus has forgiven us of all the evil that we have ever done. Before we even asked and he simply wants us to embrace, he wants to embrace us as brothers and as sons of his heavenly father. And he wants to heal us of all the hurt and pain that sin has inflicted. And all he asks is that we turn around and embrace his goodness too. And that we share that goodness in the, with the world, not just through words, but more importantly through how we live. Through how we act justly and love mercy. And walk humbly with our gods. If this is your desire this morning, why don't you stand with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we want to embrace your justice and love and mercy. We want to be like you, Lord. We don't want to just read about being like you or talk about being like you. We want you to live your life out in and through us. And Father, you, are the, we, you have given us a responsibility here on this earth. We may be the only people that, that, that someone out there can see Jesus through. We may be the only conduit for someone to see what Jesus really is like to someone to see how his justice really works by helping to heal and, and protect and restore those who have been hurt. We may be the only time anyone in, 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 in this life, someone may be able to see what true mercy is like. And Father, we know that justice and mercy will transform us. It will allow us to, 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 to participate, you to participate with us in the process of being saved right here on this earth as you turn us into people who reflect your image. And so, Father, we know this work. We can't do it ourselves. We know it's beyond our capabilities. But we open our hearts to you this morning. And we invite you in, and we surrender ourselves to you. And we ask you to transform us, Lord. We want to be just like you. And I pray as we, as we leave this place, Lord, that we remember 
that you love us, that you died for us, and that your, your everything you gave is because you want us to be like you too. You want us to be able to go home and live with you, Lord. And we look forward to that final day when, when, when that process is complete and when you save us from the very presence of sin itself and we get to spend time with you in that glorious heavenly kingdom. May this be the reality of every person under my voice. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.